I spent my childhood living in a thick forest. All the residents of the area would build houses in scattered groupings. So my family lived towards the top of a small hill with five different neighbors' houses, all occupying the same three-acre space. Living out there meant we had a pretty carefree lifestyle. Being rural meant we didn't have a homeowners association or anything. Our yards were free to have whatever we wanted. Some people had workshops set up out of sheds. One woman, Ms. Briggs, made statues out of metal. Her whole yard was littered with scrap. We even set up a communal garden that all the neighbors could use. Us kids, there were seven of us, were allowed to roam the surrounding area freely. During the fall and spring, we were homeschooled by our mothers. There was a creek nearby where we could swim in the summer. We'd explore the woods in search of wildflowers and pine cones. We were out there so much that we made a big fort from fallen tree branches we collected. However, there was one rule that everyone who lived in the forest had to follow. We couldn't step foot on the ground outside when it rained. None of us ever really understood the rule. At first, I was especially curious about it. Perhaps it was because I knew the adults had to follow it, too. The idea of adults having to follow rules was unfathomable to me. I thought they made the rules, so couldn't they just change them? I asked my parents about it a lot, but they always shut me down. They would tell me that they didn't have to justify their reasons, because they were in charge. As long as everyone obeyed, we didn't need to know why the rule existed. So, for many years, none of us put too much thought into it. Everything was uneventful. Our days followed a regular pattern. Breakfast, school, lunch, chores, playtime, and dinner. On rainy days, we were just kept inside to play. Our parents watched the news very regularly to keep tabs on the weather, but sometimes rain would come as a surprise. One of these surprise rains came when I was 14. Several of the adults had gone into town for dinner and a movie. They left in the late afternoon, around 3 p.m. Us kids were split up amongst two houses. Being one of the oldest, I was in charge of three of the younger kids. Sammy, Evan, and Trixie were their names. Sammy was Evan's older sister. She was 10 and he was 8. Trixie was Ms. Briggs' daughter, and she was 3. At the house next door, Nelson, who was 16, was in charge of his two younger siblings. Victoria, who was 9, and, Owen, who was 5. At first, everything went smoothly. I put on a movie for Sammy and Evan, complete with some microwave popcorn. Then I set Trixie up at the kitchen table to watch some toddler show, with the headphones and portable DVD player Ms. Briggs sent over. Once all three of the kids were situated, I flopped down on the couch and started texting Nelson to see how he was doing. We chatted back and forth for a while, until I heard a familiar pitter-patter on the tin roof of our house. I looked out the kitchen window, and, sure enough, it was beginning to rain. My phone rang then. My mom was calling. I stepped down the hallway to answer, since I didn't want to worry the others. You guys are all inside, right? She asked. Her voice had an undertone of panic. Yes, mom. We're all inside, I said. I heard her sigh with relief and tell all the other adults. We're gonna play it by ear for now, since we haven't even finished dinner yet, she said. But if it keeps raining like this, we'll have to stay at a hotel or something until it stops. I told her that I understood, and we quickly finished the call. I sent a quick message to Nelson to make sure he knew what was going on, then went to read some magazines. A few hours later, I made the kids some chicken nuggets with macaroni and cheese. While they were eating, I heard what sounded like yelling coming from outside. I stepped out onto the porch and looked next door. Nelson and Owen were standing on their front steps getting pelted by the raindrops. It looked like Owen was crying. But Mr. Fluff is out there. He cried. Nelson was kneeled down and trying to console his brother. I scanned their front yard and saw that Owen's favorite stuffed animal was on the hood of their dad's truck. Owen kept trying to go get it, but Nelson was holding him back. The rain started coming down harder and the five-year-old wailed at the top of his lungs. By this point, the three kids at my house, as well as Nelson's sister, came out to see what was happening. Little Trixie whimpered when some thunder boomed overhead, so I picked her up and propped her on my hip. Owen's sobbing continued until Nelson hoisted him over his shoulder and carried him back inside the house. I ushered Sammy and Evan inside my house as well. Since it was a little after 7 p.m. at this point, I went ahead and changed Trixie into her pajamas and laid her down to sleep in my bed. Luckily, she dozed off without any fuss. When 8.30 rolled around, I told the other two to get ready for bed and tuck them into their sleeping bags on my bedroom floor. I texted my mom to let her know that everything was good. She told me that they were getting a hotel and that the rain was supposed to be over by morning. 
I must have dozed off on the couch, because what I remember next is waking up to a loud slam from outside. My phone's clock said it was 11.37 PM. I grabbed a small flashlight from our entry table drawer and stepped out onto the porch to see if maybe a raccoon had toppled over one of the trash cans. Both were still upright, so I turned back to the front door. As I did, I caught a quick glimpse of another flashlight beam in my peripheral. I looked over and saw Owen stepping over to his front steps, his light on the stuffed animal on the truck. I looked frantically around for something I could use. Our feet couldn't touch the ground, but, judging from our porches and steps, our feet could touch other things, so long as they were between our feet and the ground. I spotted the pair of five-gallon buckets that our mom used to carry soil to and from the garden. I snatched both up and bolted down our porch steps. I reached out as far as I could and set the first bucket down with the bottom in the air. I carefully stepped onto it. It wiggled at first, so I had to regain my balance. I did the same thing with the second bucket, using them almost like stepping stones between the sets of porch steps. I jumped from the second bucket to the bottom step in front of Owen. He jerked back and shrieked. I grabbed him and jogged back up to his front door, kicking it open with my foot. Nelson must have heard the commotion because he met me in the living room. I passed his brother over. He was going for Mr. Fluff, I panted. I leaned over to catch my breath for a second, and that's when I heard it. My house's screen door creaked open and then slammed shut. I raced back outside. Trixie was standing at the top of the steps, rubbing at her eyes with little fists. I had a bad dream, she whined when she spotted me. She started making her way down the steps. I worked my way onto the first bucket I could reach, but the distance between it and Nelson's porch was wider than that of my own. By the time I finally got balanced, Trixie was at our bottom step. Trixie, honey, stay there. Stay on the steps, I said frantically. Her face twisted up and she let out a small sob. But I want to hold your hand, she said through tears. Before I could speak again, she took the final step. As soon as her bare foot touched the wet dirt, the rumbling started. It was a low and deep sound that vibrated through the air. I realized that it was getting louder. Closer. I hopped off the bucket and sprinted to Trixie. I yanked her into my arms and got one foot onto the porch steps, when I felt something grab my boot. I clung to Trixie, pulling as hard as I could until my boots lit off. I fell onto the porch steps with a thud. Behind me, I heard a strange throaty sound. I scrambled past the porch door and flicked the light. Outside was a creature like I'd never seen before. It had long, spindly arms that tapered off into needle-like fingers that held my boot. Its torso was unnaturally thin, maybe 10 inches around at the thinnest point and its head was shaped like a cone with a sharp point at the top. The porch light illuminated its pale pinkish skin. It had huge eyes that were completely pitch black, but no mouth or nose. As it stared through the screen of the door, it started making that throaty sound again. Something between a grunt and a growl. I kept Trixie's face pressed against my shoulder to keep her from looking up at the creature. It was like time froze. The only movement came from the creature as it swayed back and forth, almost like a serpent staring at me with those obsidian eyes. Finally, it sunk back into the damp earth, not leaving so much as a small hole when it went. I breathed a sigh of relief and took Trixie back to bed. I didn't fall back asleep that night. I never did tell my parents what happened that night, and Trixie didn't seem to remember. The rain had stopped sometime after midnight, and I'd picked the buckets up the following morning before the adults got back. Nelson and Owen never told their parents anything either, probably because they didn't want to get in trouble. It's been almost 15 years since that day, and I now live in a suburb, far from that forest I grew up in. I have my own two kids now. Even though I'm hundreds of miles away, I still find, that whenever we leave the house in the rain, I stare anxiously at the ground under my children's feet.